Hey everyone, it's Doug. So it's a really busy time for the war on cars. We are deep into the final edits of our book and we're really excited with how it's shaping up. We can't wait to tell you all more information about it really soon. We promise we'll have cover artwork, a title, everything, and you will all be the first to know. In the meantime, we are dropping this old bonus into the feed. It's an interview with Professor Herman Knopflocker of the Vienna University of Technology. Professor Knopflocker is a really cool guy. He is perhaps best known for creating something called the Getzoig, or the Walkmobile, which, well, you'll hear about it in the episode. Trust me, it's pretty awesome. This is the kind of bonus content you get when you become a Patreon supporter of The War on Cars. Your contributions allow us to keep the podcast going and growing, and we are truly humbled by everyone's support. If you are not already signed up on Patreon, you can go to thewaroncars.org, click support us, and you can become a member for just $3 per month. Not only will you get access to exclusive bonus episodes like this one, but you'll also get free stickers, a handwritten note, merch discounts, and a whole lot more. We actually have a live show coming up, and Patreon supporters will get early access to tickets. So stay tuned. We're also working on a bunch of brand new episodes that we know you're going to enjoy. The first of those is coming shortly. Thanks again for your support. This is The War on Cars. I'm Doug Gordon, and welcome to a special bonus episode just for Patreon supporters. Some of you might remember this old Uber ad. It's from 2017, and it shows people moving around the streets of Bangkok wearing giant cardboard boxes. In the ad, we see people in the cardboard boxes getting angry, bumping into each other, unable to pass each other on narrow streets, clogging highways, and getting frustrated as they search for a place to put their big boxes when they're done with them, until the entire city is overrun by giant cardboard boxes. Plus, there's the music choice, the Bare Necessities, which is the song from the Disney movie The Jungle Book, which is a really nice added touch. Because really, when you strip a car down to its bare necessities, its single purpose, nobody's really happy in one. And by representing automobiles not as stylish objects of design or cutting-edge technology, but as simple geometric shapes that are far bigger than the person they're transporting, the ad does a fantastic job of demonstrating why private cars don't work in urban settings, at least not when everyone has one. Now, obviously, Uber's role in many cities' congestion woes is a topic for another episode, but the idea of representing a car as a giant box that's literally worn by a person comes from an Austrian professor named Hermann Knopflocker. Professor Knopflocker, who has a background in civil engineering and mathematics, is the head of the Institute of Transportation at the Vienna University of Technology, where he's worked since 1975. That same year, he invented something called the Getzoig, which translates from German to English as walkmobile. It's a wearable wooden frame meant to demonstrate the spatial inefficiency of cars. In the nearly 50 years since the Getzoig was invented, it's evolved into a powerful protest tool for people advocating for livable streets and sustainable cities. Now, as you can imagine, Professor Knopflocker is a very strong critic of the automobile, making him not just an engineer or a planner, but one of the world's preeminent philosophers about the effects of cars on people and the environment. And long before COVID, he even compared the automobile to a virus. More on that coming up. At 81 years old, Professor Knopflocker is still very active in the planning world, and his observations on what cars have done to society are more relevant than ever. I was so grateful that he agreed to join the War on Cars for an interview. One note about this episode, stick with it, I promise. The first bit gets into the origins of the Getzoig and some of the professor's work in Vienna early in his career, but the later parts are where we really dig in to some of his more philosophical musings on the problems with cars. Trust me, you're going to love it. Please enjoy my conversation with Herman Knopflocker. Professor Knopflocker, welcome to The War on Cars. Oh, I... Thank you very much for inviting me. 
So I wanted to start by talking about the Getzoig, the Walkmobile, which you created in 1975. I think some of our listeners will be familiar with it or have seen pictures of it, but others will not be familiar with it. Could you describe it? I'd love to talk about your motivation for creating it. Well, I will start with the motivation and the idea when it comes to me. I, normally, I am commuting in, with public transport, but once uh, in the 70s, I had a car and I stuck into congestion and st- start thinking now how stupid I am here to <laughs> stuck in the congestion and breathe the terrible air around me and in my car. And then uh, it, this reminds me on, on the first paragraph of the Austrian traffic code. And the Austrian traffic code says the street or the road is or the street is a public space which can be used by everybody under the same conditions. And I thought this time, well, I mean, my Fahrzeug in my vehicle, in my car, why shouldn't I make uh, Gehzeug? Then I will occupy the same kind of space like uh, the car user is doing is. And then I went back, <laughs> I went to the Institute and make the first drawings. And these drawings I presented on slides uh, at this time in different universities. And the, this slide encouraged a lot of uh, students to build this Gehzeug. And then they sent me pictures from their activities. And this started, I would see the uh, global <laughs> global occupation of, of the skate side because it shows exactly uh, what is happening, uh, how much space we uh, occupy. But what, what is interesting, if you are going around with the gate side, everybody thinks you are totally crazy. Uh, but if you use a car, everybody respects you. And the politician said, OK, there, we must uh, provide more space uh, for the automobile. The gates so goes directly into your brain, then uh, you recognize, okay, something is wrong. And uh, this is very interesting. So since this time, uh, the gates so is in use and uh, it started with uh, activities from my students from other universities. Uh, and it's today very common, I think, uh, globally. And in fact, the, you have a great quote where I read an interview where you, you talk about that if you walked around with a wooden frame with four armchairs in it and just left it somewhere and expected to be given that space. People, as you said, would think you were were crazy or entitled or antisocial. And yet that is exactly what we expect with a car. Yeah, this is exactly what is happening. If I leave my, my gates somewhere in the public space on the street and I put four chairs into it, then no shop owner would think that some money will come out of this of this uh, situation. But if the car is parking in front of his shop, he thinks, oh, <laughs> there are rich people that are coming. So I want to talk about your, your work uh, in the planning world. You were involved in various efforts, very early efforts to reduce the amount of private cars in Vienna. And yes. uh, this was long before such efforts were very common, as we see in Paris, London, and other cities. Yeah. What was the reaction like when you began your work? Well, I, I was a very young planner when the uh, city of Vienna was uh, building the, the U-Bahn, the subway. And they invited me because at this time, no other planner wanted to do this. I was a killing job job to pedestrianize the city center at this time. Uh, so I think the uh, politicians thought, okay, this is a young planner, we can use them up, him up uh, to make this, uh, at this time, very, very difficult and dangerous work. And uh, so I had uh, the opportunity to pedestrianize the city center and mo- make all the traffic arrangements, traffic organization, and so on, which were implemented at this time because they, they had the the city had already planned to pedestrianize it, but nobody had the courage to do it. But, uh, but finally, it was a success. But this was just uh, something which uh, started in 1969, and the pedestrian areas were opened in 74. But in 72, uh, we had a big uh, movement against the plans to build motorways in the second ring and uh, along the first uh, districts. Uh, district. At this time, there was a public uprise, and I supported this uprise also because at this time, uh, I, I know that the motorway in the city is crazy and will, it will de- destroy the city. So I supported it, but at this time, I hadn't uh, the whole knowledge and the whole consequences known as I have it today or some years later after. 
And the city of Vienna, this was a part of the master plan of the city of Vienna for some years in the 1969 master plan, it is still included. And since the opposition was very strong, the mayor decided in 1972 to skip the smaller ways. We have still some fragments of the smaller ways, which was already built at this time, but the rest of the city is still a moderate fray in this area. And so the city of Vienna had no master plan at, uh, anymore at this time. And uh, they invited, I became professor in 1975, and they invited four professors uh, to develop the new master plan. They gave us four year time and money to work on the new the background of the new master plan. Now, one of the colleagues was working on main streets, motorways and something like uh, that. The other one was working on heavy rail, uh, public transport. The third one was uh, working on economy. I think what all the other stuff the other didn't want. Uh, pedestrians, cycling, well, cycling didn't want at all to have it in the program. It was had no future at this time. Why, why didn't they want cycling in the plan at the time? Not at all, not at all. Why not? Because Vienna has no cycling and the politicians at this time and the administration thought it will have never cycling. We are, they thought, well, we are not Copenhagen, we are not uh, Amsterdam because we are Vienna. I find it so fascinating that in the 1970s, people in Vienna were saying, we are not Amsterdam, we are not Copenhagen, we are Vienna. Today, yeah. in New York City, in cities around North America, all over the world, you, you still hear that. Yeah. What's your reaction to the fact that that argument endures? Uh, well, uh, this, I think, uh, is a preoccupation of some, I would say, fundamentalistic behavior, uh, because they are captured in this car-oriented thinking. Uh, this is not the question, uh, if it, this is a city in Copenhagen or somewhere else, the, the question is, how can we help people to get in a better future? So I came into this field and I was very much interested in how people behave. I was struck by something I read in another interview where you said that the biggest obstacle to fixing traffic congestion and the problems created by cars is stupidity. And I wanted to dive in there a little bit and ask what you mean by that. <laughs> well, uh, if it wouldn't be so stupid, we wouldn't have so much problems with the transport. <laughs> that is true. Kill. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't have the climate problems. We wouldn't have the, uh, the killing on the roads. Uh, and we wouldn't have so many... Uh, people in the hospitals uh, from accidents and so on and so on. And we wouldn't destroy our cities. We wouldn't destroy the local economy and something like that. But things are happening because we have exceeded our evolutionary borders uh, about the speed and perception of the environment. And if we go into a situation which is created by the car, that you have a huge amount of power, which is a thousand times more than as a pedestrian, your brain don't follow. Along those lines about sort of power and superiority, nobody becomes a better person behind the wheel of a car. People get very angry. They are short-tempered. They can behave in ways that we, outside of the car, experience as sociopathic. And, and yet we also hear that people love to drive. So, you know, setting aside car dependency as the, the thing that forces people to drive, how would you explain why people love to do something that is so harmful to them, to the built environment, to the natural world, and to other people? The easiest way to explain it uh, is uh, that uh, the feeling of power, the feeling of freedom, and the environmental conditions we have provided for the car gave them very short benefits. But all the other things you mentioned before, which is damage of the city, damage of the local economy, damage of the noise, uh, the noise environment, uh, the air pollution and something like that, they don't have di direct feedbacks about this. Once things are happening too fast, uh, we don't have the senses and the, uh, to the receptors to understand what we are doing because the, the things are happening out of our uh, evolutionary experience. Our evolutionary experience is a pedestrian experience, uh, but uh, we have prepared a world not for people, we have prepared a world for a new kind of beings. This is the car driver. We started the discussion about the Gezeug. I, I, I was about to bring back the idea that the Gezeug lays that idea bare, right? That we, 
you would not expect to, I, I think you've written that you wouldn't expect to walk around your city spraying carcinogenic gases in the faces of other people. Yes. And yet with a car, you do that and you're on your way before you can even, even contemplate that there are any effects to that at all. But the problem is that the decision makers, the planners, have also the car in the brain. And if you have a car in your brain, you make, you make a world for cars. And if you have a car in your brain, you spend a lot of money uh, to have a car or use a car and something like that. Or you make an environment which is uh, not safe for children, which is not healthy for children, which isolate you. Because uh, this, this created a very different behavior of this car-oriented society the whole history of mankind before, because the people now accept to live in cages. They live in a driving cage. They have their cage in this office. Uh, this is uh, not the normal behavior of, uh, of people as they lived for uh, five or six million of years, or at least uh, 10,000 years in, in normal cities. So you mentioned uh, the way that the car burrows itself into the brain and affects everybody from individual drivers to planners. And I think that's probably a good segue to your idea that the car is a virus. You lay it out very nicely uh, in a lot of your writings and your, and your speeches, and you have a book that is called Virus Auto, The Story of Destruction. How are cars like a virus? Well, I have written, I've written in the virus book uh, because the normal behavior is that we have a cell, a cell and the uh, virus coupled with the cell and enter the cell and then the cell is starting, body cell is starting to replicate the, the virus. Uh, the virus control the control center because a virus has no own uh, energy. And the virus car, because the, var uh, the car change our behavior like the uh, virus is changing the behavior of the body cell because the body cell, when she has accepted the virus into the, the inner part of the body, then the virus control its beha their behavior, its behavior. So the car has changed the whole value system of the society, like the virus is changing the whole value system of a cell, because the normal cell is supporting the functions of the body. And this is happening globally. This is one of the reasons why cars have spread out over the all continents and the difference to so the normal virus is that we, we know the situation of a normal virus and we, we fight against uh, killing people. But for cars, we are doing quite the opposite. We support them with money. We support them with a lot of privilege uh, nobody has if, if he's a human. You cannot uh, make a noise uh, like a car. Then you are charged or the police take you away from public space when you are drunk or something like that. But if you are in a car, you, you pollute the air with uh, all kinds of, uh, of poison, uh, poison air and something like that. You, you occupy the space for children. Uh, you destroy the environment of cities and the people accept everything because they are behaving like the body cell. Everything you're saying, it, it all seems to come down to speed and obviously space. Yeah. And, and you have a great quote that I read about comparing that the driver is much different from humans than any insect because no insect moves so quickly in its natural habitat that it kills itself or others. Yes. And there's no insect that sacrifices its own children's habitat or its offspring as parents do. This can only happen if uh, the car is deeper in your brain than uh, children love. There's no other, I would say, addiction which is so deep-rooted in our brain like the car. I've also read, speaking of children, that you, you have very strong opinions about playgrounds uh, and have written or spoken about sort of their place in society as opposed to the amount of space that we give cars. Yeah. Well, it is crazy that we, we cage children in their playground and let cars move around it and, and make the playgrounds everywhere. Uh, normally, uh, when I came to, in, to Vienna in 1959, there were not many, car, many cars uh, in, in the streets, and uh, I, I got some of my, my living out of teaching mathematics uh, to st st students. And at this time, the children had their soccer, I would say, games or soccer games on the streets. This is not possible anymore today because everything is occupied by, by, by cars, and they are pushed back on the sidewalks, which is... Unbelievable. 
10,000 years of uh, urban society, people used the public space, which means the street. And you mentioned sidewalks and how children used to play in the street, and now they are relegated to the sides of streets. You even have very strong opinions about the, the word sidewalk, which yes. is not necessarily translatable exactly one-to-one in every language, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, because in Germany it is called Gehsteig, which means in a small path, for example, on the mountains and something like that. This is everything, because uh, I think uh, to grow up, you must get in contact with the society. I grew up in a car-free environment in the, in the village in Carinthia in South Austria, and there were no cars there. Well, the first cars which came very far uh, were war vehicles from the uh, occupied, uh, occupying army. Uh, but uh, I had a wonderful uh, childhood uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, so I have still, I would say, I have never lost the con- contact with the, with the earth, contact of my feet with the earth. And, and this is not happening today anymore. Because children normally, if they are using, uh, or if they, are move, they are moved to somewhere, they are moved with a car. They don't walk uh, very, very far. For us, it was totally normal to walk one, two or three kilometers, like for the Dutch, where they cycled for even 10, 15 kilometers in every kind of weather condition. This is the normal behavior. And uh, we are totally away from this uh, normal behavior. And this costs a lot of energy. This produced uh, a lot of noise, produced a lot of air pollution, and all these other things we have already mentioned before, but the people don't recognize it because they are very comfortable in their car. Even on bad weather, they have uh, air condition in the car, but the pedestrian has no air condition. He's exposed to all the weather situations, which is good. Then he knows uh, a little bit uh, about how nature is doing. I always find that very funny that, you know, especially I sometimes joke that Americans like to fancy themselves very tough, very rugged individuals. But the minute you mention that you walk or bike everywhere, the first question you get from people who drive is, oh, my gosh, well, what what do you do when it rains? What do you do when it's cold? And my answer is always, I get wet, I get a little cold, and I'm fine. Uh, and you're healthy. <laughs> yes, and I'm, I'm more in tune with my environment, exactly. Um you know, we're, we're talking so much about the negative externalities of automobiles and how they impose all these costs on people who aren't in cars. You know, foul air, noise, danger. You are a proponent of making motorists more directly responsible for the costs associated with driving. How does that translate into policy, in your view? So today we have a, a tremendous amount of subsidies to make this car society running. We subsidize the parking places, we subsidize the use of uh, fossil for fuel, fossil energy and something like that. We have a lot of priorities. Uh, so if you put money on all of this uh, or take away uh, the subs- subsidies, which means bring cars back into the normal market economy. Then for example, in Vienna, the parking, in the, in the city it would cost about 500 to six, 700 euro per month. And if we put the right price, the people can behave in the right uh, manner. What do you say to people who believe that charging market rates for parking, for example, is a regressive tax that it unfairly hurts poor people, wealthy people can afford to pay it, poor people who depend on cars, especially in places like America, where there are a few options other than cars, you know, what other policies are at uh, politicians and elected officials' disposal to counter that argument? Well, it's very difficult to counter this argument. Well, uh, the situation that the poor people are ha- have the biggest de- disadvantage is, is very easy because if you take the uh, parking fees, uh, you have to support, uh, put, put the money into public transport, put the money to make pedestrian areas, put the money into cycle lanes. Then you have the money uh, to change the environment for the people, and then they are able to read the other informations from the environment, and then they start walking, they start cycling, and they start using public transport. I, I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about that relationship between time and distance and speed. You've written yeah. about prioritizing transportation modes, that walking should be prioritized first, cycling should follow, public transit, 
should come after that. And that you say that we mostly don't need high speeds, which I think to Americans sounds surprising, where, where speed is a premium, it's a, it's a feature advertised in every car, zero to 60 in three seconds and all the rest. What do you mean that we don't need high speeds in transportation? Well, uh, you can have high speed if you like it, uh, but you, if, you, if you would like to have high speeds, then you have to carry all the costs and all the risks uh, of having a high speed. But uh, th this was not my approach because I grew up with all the knowledge or I would say the <laughs> ignorance uh, which was taught at the universities. And I believe that uh, if I drive faster, I can save uh, time. And uh, it was very interesting for me when I make uh, transport planning in, one of, in many cities in the 70s. One of the, in one of the cities I recognized uh, in, it was the city of Wales, about 50,000 inhabitants. And, and they, I'm doing all my planning on the basis of surveys. So the people get questionnaires and uh, ask them to send them back and so and then we analyzed it. And it was very interesting at this time, it was about 1972 or 1974. Uh, then I uh, could draw the, the distribution of travel times for each kind of modes. And uh, what, what was interesting is that the travel time distribution of pedestrians cyclists and cars was more or less identical. And then we could calculate the average speed of these three modes. And if you calculate the speed on the cities, we had a uh, walking speed between origin and destination, uh, which was average three kilometers an hour. And the driving, uh, the speed of cars was about 17 kilometers an hour, which means about six times more. They had a much longer distance, uh, but at the same time, the time is always the same. What is happening uh, if this uh, system behave in this way uh, are two things. First of all, each trip has an origin and destination. If the people uh, rely on cars, the destination is much farther away compared to the uh, pedestrian environment. And then you can explain why the old cities have everything around it. This is the density and variety of the city. Everybody is dreaming and talking today about it, but everybody thinks he can do it with a car. This is not possible. So if you want to have a human scale city, you must take out the car. This is the consequence, which I have written in many textbooks and publications. So final question, and I want to get back to the idea of the car's virus and tie it together with the Gezoig, the walkmobile. Yeah, yeah. So that was designed to show the absurd amount of space that cars take up. And the idea now of everyone having their own private bubble, a sort of social distancing machine, reads very differently. Obviously, the need to stop the spread of COVID, you know, means that so many people have been forced to do what cars do, which is retreat into enclosed environments. They isolate themselves from the outside world. And in many cases, they did it actually by turning to cars. We've seen congestion go way up in New York City, where I live, and in cities around the world, car sales have gone way up, have rebounded entirely in many places. How do we break this cycle of people trying to solve the problem of cars by turning to cars? I think the, the reason why the people are dependent on cars uh, is uh, that uh, what we are doing, uh, we try in, in the car traffic is exactly what we try to prevent in the virus, uh, COVID-19, or, or virus uh, uh, in dangers. In a normal, the normal treatment of all virus uh, is to prevent coupling with a cell. And if you have developed the, the vaccination uh, today, which is going on globally, the main focus is to prevent coupling. And this is exactly what we have to do with the car also. We have to prevent coupling of cars and human activities take out the cars of human environment, uh, which means out of cities, out of villages. I'm not against the car, but we have to reorganize parking. Uh, instead of using money to build motorways or to build parking uh, in the city, we should take the money to park the cars outside of the city where you have a good connection with bikes or with uh, public transport to and in the city and leave the car outside of the city. Then you get a human scale city. So prevent coupling, which means change parking. 
Professor Knopflocker, thank you so much for this conversation. It was fascinating. And thank you for not just joining the war on cars, but being an early fighter in the war on cars. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. That's it for my interview with Herman Knopflocker. If you use it as a jumping off point to read more of his writings and interviews, that's perfect. There are links to some other interviews in the show notes. Unfortunately, his book, Virus Auto, is not available in English, but hopefully it will be someday. I want to thank Florian Kolber and Stefan Drashan in Berlin for first introducing me to Professor Knopflocker and suggesting I reach out to him. And of course, I want to thank all of you for your continued support of The War on Cars. Last year was just an awesome one for the podcast, and this year is shaping up to be even bigger and better. We mean it when we say we couldn't do it without you. I'm Doug Gordon, and on behalf of my co-hosts, Aaron Napperstek and Sarah Goodyear, this is The War on Cars. <laughs> <laughs>